This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, welcome everyone um, to today's Shir. Ruchem Abom to the Kala Agatha Pirkja here in Kugarn Hills, New York. Okay, we have unbelievable material today. Incredible material. Fasten your seatbelts. We're going to ask a lot of questions, at least eight questions. And the good news is, there's only one answer. Okay? So, uh, we know the Torah speaks at length about the Shidduch between um, Yitzchak and Rivka, how Eliezer, how Eliezer Ebed Avram is sent to uh, Aram Naharayim to get a, to find a Shidduch for Yitzchak. And in fact, there are many, many psukim discussing this. It's a very, it's a big parsha. It's 67 psukim, a uh, parak chavdalid in parshas Chayi Sarah. And actually the story appears two times. We have the story as it unfolds, and then we have Eliezer recounting to Lavan and Basuel exactly how it happened. So they're basically, not, right, to, to, for the moment, we'll see, we'll see how not exactly it was, but the, the, basically the Torah repeats it, uh, uh, kemat, uh, word for word, except for we'll see some nuances of difference. And it's a very unusual thing, because we know every word in the Torah is priceless. Every extra letter we dash in things. And here, not only is there an extra letter, not only are there extra words and extra psukim, but the whole episode is repeated, which prompts Rashi to quote the Divrei Chazal, who say, Yafeh sichasan shal avdei avais, yoisar mitarasan shal banim. Um, more pleasing, more beautiful, is the conversation of the Eved, of the Avais, than even the Torah of Kal Yisrael. Because the Torah of Kal Yisrael, we learn out certain halachas from an extra letter or an extra word. And yet, when it comes to... When it comes to um, this episode, the Torah speaks about it at very great length. And therefore Rashi brings down, But as we're going to see, that in fact, this is not just repetitious, it's not superfluous. The Torah is not just recounting the story as it unfolds, but rather, uh, we're going to see there are very important nuances to pick up on, and that's what we're going to bring to uh, our attention, the Ezra's Hashem. Okay, so let's begin in the beginning. Vayoymer Avraham el Avdai, Avraham says to his servant, Zikan Beisai, the elder statesman of his house, Hamoishel Bechal Asherloi, who ruled over everything that was his, Simna Yadcha Tacha Sirechi, please place your hand under my thigh. So what does this mean? What is this expression, Zikan Beisai? What is the expression, Hamoisha B'chal Asharloi? So the Bereshis Rabbah says something astounding. Says the Bereshis Rabbah, Parshan Antes Oizchas, Vayoymer Avraham El Avdoi Zikan Beisai, Shahoya Ziv Ikoinin Shaloi Doimeloi. The features, the splendor of the face of Eliezer was similar to that of Avraham Avinu. Now you can imagine what Avraham Avinu looked like. I've seen tzaddikim in my life. I've seen people who you see the shechina on their face. And uh, just imagine the radiance of Avraham Avinu. Imagine the splendor of shechina on the face of Avraham Avinu. And comes the medrash and the medrash says, Eliezer was a spitting image of Avraham Avinu. Whatever Hadras Panim Avraham had, Eliezer matched it. That's an incredible uh, accolade for Eliezer. The medrash goes weiter. Hamoisha b'chol ha-shaloi. Shahaya shalit b'yitzroi kamoisai. As, so, uh, as great as the self-control that Avraham Avinu had over himself, after all, we know he was called Avraham. Originally he was called Avram, because uh, he, had, he had dominion over 243 limbs, but who could have dominion over their eyes and their ears? Imagine a, per- a person's learning in a room. Their head is down, and someone in the back of the room is speaking Lash and Hara. So you hear it. There, you know, there's, no, there's no way to control the not to hear it. Something passes in front of you. You see it. No, Avram Avinu didn't see it. Avram Avinu didn't hear it. When Chazal say that Avram ruled over his 248 limbs, that means they only did, saw, experience what was according to the Dvar Hashem. And come Chazal, and they say, That as great as Avram Avinu's dominion and power over his Ramach Evarim, Eliezer matched it. You know, so, you know, if I were to ask, who are the greatest people who ever lived? You know, you might put Eliezer up there on the list. He looked like Avraham. He had Kvishas Hayetzer like Avraham. 
An amazing thing. He's the Kan Beisai. He's Moisel B'chol HaShaloi. And yet a few psukim later, in Perak uh, Chavdal Pasakei, by number three, Vayim Elav HaEved, the servant, the slave says to Abraham, Ulai loy soy ve ho isha la leches acharai, ela aratzazois. Maybe this woman is not going to want to find, uh, follow me to go to that land. He hashev ashev es bincha. Should I bring your son, ela aratzah she yotzas misham? In other words, if the, if the woman's not going to come back with me, maybe I should take the boy to her. So chazal ar medayik, vayoymer ilav ho ever, hadahu dechsev. From here we derive, Kenan. Those who descend from Canaan, biyadai moizne mirma, in their hands are the scales of deceit. La ashaik ahev, they love to oppress. Meaning, anyone from Canaan, they're deceitful, they're dishonest, they're not straightforward. Who is this referring to? Canaan zeli ezer, biyadai moizne mirma, that he had an improper balance, an improper uh, thought process, an improper decision making. Shahayo yoishev, he sat. Umashkel as bitai and evaluated his own daughter. Ruya he ayena ruya. Is she fit? Is she not fit? Meaning he improperly considered that perhaps his own daughter would be fit for Yitzchak. La ashoyik ahev. He loved to oppress. Who's that? La ashoyik ahuvay shalaylam to oppress the beloved of God. Is that Yitzchak? Amar he said ulai loy soyve. Perhaps he will not want the etain loy as biti and I will give him my daughter. Amar loy, so Avram said, "Look, Eliezer, let's let's forget all this political correct business. Forget all this, you know, social niceties. You know, with all the political correct and social niceties, nobody gets the truth. So let me just tell you how it is. Okay, I'm sorry to tell this to you. Ata Aror, you are the definition of being cursed. You come from Canaan. Uvni Baruch, my son is blessed. Vein Aram is Daik Baruch. Blessing doesn't mix with, miss with curse." You know, you're just, you're just intrinsically cursed. You might be a nice guy, you might be a great guy, you are error, and therefore, basically get lost. Don't even, don't even entertain the possibility. I know you don't like it, it doesn't sound right, it's not very liberal, it's not very progressive, but that's called Judaism, okay? So therefore, we, tell, we say the truth, we say it how it is, you're an error, and, and uh, we're Baruch. The problem is, that, how does that reconcile with the fact that first Chazal say Eliezer was like the Gadol Hadar. He looks like Avraham. He has Kvisha Sayyidse like Avraham. And then the next thing you know, Avraham calls him an Auror. You know, that, that's a pretty righteous uh, Auror that we got on our hands. You know, he looks like Avraham. He has control over his, his Yitzhah like Avraham. I guarantee you, you don't know any, you don't, you've never met anyone who has Kvisha Sayyidse like Eliezer. You've never seen anyone, neither has your father or grandfather. Eliezer was on the Madrega of Avraham Avinu, and at the same time Avraham says, you're Auror. So, how does that fit? Was Avraham a Ger? Was he? Okay, I don't know. Was Eliezer a Ger? He couldn't find a better job. I'm not sure. <laughs> was he part of the Yes Hanefesh Asher Asu B'charon? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Because it, it does, in such a case, we have a problem. I mean, could, could um, Avraham, uh, could Yitzchak marry his daughter? Maybe she would convert. I don't know. Yeah. Question number two. Parak Chav Dalet, Pasa Gimel. So Avraham turns to Eliezer and he says, listen up. Listen up, Eliezer. I will make you swear by Hashem, by the God God of the heaven, God of the earth. Sounds like a good idea. You know, whenever you want to make someone swear, it's always good to try to get God involved, try to make them take it seriously. Then, a few psukim later, in Pasuk Zayin, Hashem, uh, Avram is talking to Eliezer. Make sure you don't take my kid there. Hashem Hashemayim, God, the God of the heavens. Avraham, why are you demoting Hakadosh Baruch Hu? Few psukim earlier, Hashem was Hashem Elokei Hashemayim Elokei Aretz, and all of a sudden now Hashem is only Elokei Hashemayim. So you say, come on, Rabbi, that's not a good question. Rashi asked that question. And what does Rashi answer? Rashi says that the reason Avraham did not say, 
even though earlier he did, is now, today, God is the God of the heavens. But earlier, when I was uh, back in, uh, in my father's house, at that point in time, God's name was not recognized in the world, and he was only like a Hashemayim. Okay, that's how Rashi learns it. Ein beis hamedrash b'li chidosh. That's another question on the table. Why in Pasuk Gimel is Hashem like Hashem and Aretz, and in Pasuk Zayin, Hashem is like Hashemayim. Fine. Number three. Let's take a look at number six. Hashem like Hashemayim, asher lekachani mi beis avi. God, the God of the heavens, who took me out of my father's house, my Eretz, my Ladati, and the land of my birth, Va'ashar Diberli, and that he spoke to me, Va'ashar Nishbali, and that he swore to me, Lamar, Lazaracha, to your descendants, Etein Esa'aretz Hazois, Hu Yishlach Malachai Lefanecha, he will send his angel before you. Yeah, we all know this Pasuk. Abraham tells Eliezer, don't worry, Hashem will give you assistance, Hashem will bolster your efforts. Hashem will give you siyata deshmaya. He's going to send his angel. One problem. You could read this parsha, Shnayim Mikra, the Echot Targum. You could read it a thousand times. Guess what there is no mention of in this week's parsha? A malach. So here Avram says, don't worry, Hashem will send the malach before you. What happened to the malach? What we call the case of the missing Malach. So you say, Rabbi, come on, you gave that chair two years ago, the case of the missing Malach. So first of all, apparently you don't remember it. And second of all, no, even if you do remember it, this is a different shear. This is a, okay, we're not going to give the same answer. So for, um, either remember it, go back on Torah anytime. So it's the same question, yeah. Shiva. So that's the question. You remember it? Oh, now it's coming back to you. Okay. Um, neither was I. No, I was actually. So, so the, the question is, Avraham promises that Hashem is going to send a malach, and there's no malach in the parsha. This is the question of Rav Meshulam David Salavechik Shlita, and he gives a very uh, beautiful answer, a very clear answer, that actually we all know that when Eliezer proposes the Shidduch, it says, Vayan lavanu besuel. And, um, and what happened? Then later on, it says, Vayoymer Achia Right? Her brother and her mother said back. And Rashi says, And what happened to Besuel? So Besuel tried to poison Eliezer. And the Malach came and moved the poison to Besuel. So Besuel was knocked off. Who knocked off Besuel? The Malach. That's the Malach that Abraham promised. That's how Rabbi Shalom David answers the question. And today we're going to give a different answer. So again, that was question number three. What happened to the Malach? The case of the missing Malach. Okay, number eight. Vayorot Tzoeved Lekrasa. The Eved ran to her. What are we calling this individual? An Eved. Okay. Vayoymer, and he said, Please give me a little water to drink. Number nine. Vihaish Mishta'ela. The man was bewildered. Right? The man was Mishta'e. So the man, first of all, has a name change. Because yesterday in Pasuk Yedzayin, he's called an Eved. Now he's upgraded to an Ish. Ooh. Who changed his name? Was there a ceremony? Like, what, what, why, how did his name change from Eved to Ish? Look in number 10. In, pasuk, in uh, number 10, in Perk Chavda, Pasuk Samach Aleph, in the same Pasuk, he has a different name. Vatakam Rivka. Vatakam Rivka, Vena Roiseha. Vater Kavna al Hagmalim. Vatelachna Achare Haish. Vayikacha Eved Es Rivka. So she went after the man, and the Eved took Rivka. So what? There are two people here. Is he a Ish or is he an Eved? I know, he starts off in it, uh, as an Eved, he becomes an Ish, he stays an Ish, and then he goes back to being an Eved. What's going on over here? That is question number four. Question number five. You have two personality types. You have people who are, take action, and they're decisive, and they do, and they don't wait, and then you have people who, who are pensive, and they're watch. What's going to happen? How's this going to play out? How's everyone going to react? 
And this individual, what is he? Look at number eight. He doesn't know who the woman is, but he has an intuition. This is the right shidduch. So he runs to her. Now all of a sudden he's pensive. Did God make him successful or not? I mean, well, you would think that if he doesn't know if it's a good shidduch, first be mishtaya, see first how it plays out, whether Hashem is matzliach your derech or not, and then afterwards you could take action. Why? You know, it's a little bit funny. He first he runs and then he waits. Okay, we continue on. Vayehi, number 11. Ka'ashar kilu ha'gamalem lishtois. When the camels finish drinking. Vayikach ha'ish nezem zahav. And the man took a golden ring. How much was the golden ring, uh, how much did it weigh? Beka mishkaloi. It weighed a beka. Ushnei tzimidim al yadeha. With two bracelets, Asara Zahav Mishkalam. It weighed ten golden uh, measurements. Okay. So now, not only does the Torah tell us that he gave her jewelry, the Torah tells us how much it weighs. It matters to me how much it weighs. That, that's what I have to worry about. Why do I care how much it weighs? So Rashi says, Ah, oh, it's a remez. Beka, remez l'shikle Yisrael. It's a remez to the shkolem of Kal Yisrael. Beka lagol goylas. A half a shekel per head. Ushnei tzemidim. Remez l'shnei luchais mitzumadais. It's a remez to the two twin luchais. Asaros of mishkolem. Remez l'asar sadibro. It says Rashi, these weights, these measurements are not empty. Eliezer was being meramez to Rivka. The remez is, you need to buy into this deal. This is, a good, this is going to be a good deal. Good stuff is going to happen. I'm going to give you the two bracelets. Uh, they weigh a beka. This is a nation that is, uh, has, is mekayim, the machzah sashekel. There are two bracelets. That re- that's a remez to the shnei luchais. They weigh ten uh, zahav. That's a remez to the aseres hadibrais. Okay? What is the one? Nezim. We were saying, Nezim and Smidim are two things. Right. And the Beka and the Asara Zahab, these are weights. Mm -hmm. So we are comparing different things. So the first thing is the Nezim is a symbol to the Machzah Sashakal. And the Shnei Tzimidim is a remez to the Shnei Luchais. And the Aser Sadebris. Why were they gold? And why was the Machzah Sashakal gold if it's Kasef? Yeah, I hear. It must be Miramis to something else. <laughs> One simple question. When Eliezer repeats the story, he doesn't give any of these details. Look at number 12. Who are you? Oh, I put the nose ring on her nose. Why doesn't he say, Beka Mishkaloi? Why doesn't the Pasuk say Asar Zav Meshkalem? Why are these Ramazim only mentioned and alluded to the first time around? The second time around they're absent, they're conspicuously absent. So you want to say they're a Remez, so why does the Remez only appear the first time around and not the second time around? Another interesting point. There's a stira. There's a stira. Look at number 11. So what does the guy do? What does Eliezer do? The Ish takes the Nezem Zav. It's Beka Meshkaloi. Oh, and he gives it to her. He gives her the jewelry. Ah, he doesn't know her from a hole in the wall. That doesn't stop him. After he gives it to her, he says, By the way, now that I've you know, made you... Um, now that I've made you independently wealthy, Hagidin Ali, would you mind telling me who you are? Right, that's how the story unfolds in round one. But when he repeats it over, so he has the he says it the opposite way. Look at number twelve. Who are you? I'm the daughter of Besua. Oh, now I know who you are. He flips the story. So the stira. She said, hey, come on, that's Rashi's kasha. Everybody knows Rashi. What does Rashi say? 
Really, the way it happened was he gave it to her, and then he asked who she was, because he was batuach in the merit of Avram Avinu. But he didn't want to uh, appear like a shoita to Lavan and Basuel. Who in the world is this crazy guy who gives a woman jewelry not knowing who she is? So he flipped the story. By the way, the Ramban reads the Pasuk differently. The Ramban reads it that um, he never gave it to her before. He never gave it to her before. Why would anybody do that? The Rabban reads like this. Look at number 11. In other words, the, other, the Rabban just reads it that he did it the other way around. It's interesting. There's a Shailan Halacha. We know that uh, there's certain things that you're allowed to lie about. There's certain things you're allowed to lie about. Are you allowed to lie? You're allowed to lie um, for modesty. If somebody asks, "Do I know? Do you know a certain masechta?" You're allowed to lie and say, "No, I don't know that masechta," even though you do. You're allowed. To, if somebody asks, "New, how was your host?" You know, somebody invited you for Shabbos, and you had a great time. Don't say you had such a great time, because then uh, this person's going to call your host and uh, ask to be invited. Is a person allowed to lie so they don't look foolish? Is it permitted to lie so you don't look foolish? Somebody asks you a question. Did you do X, Y, and Z? Were you the one who put the metal plate in the microwave? Was that you? Right? So if you say yes, they're, gonna, they're not going to trust you for anything anymore. They're going to think you don't have good judgment. Are you allowed to lie to sort of uh, protect yourself from embarrassment? So, it would seem according to the way uh, Rashi learns the sugya, you are allowed to lie. Because Rashi says that Eliezer changed the story so they shouldn't think that he's crazy, that he gave, him the jewelry, he gave her the jewelry and then asked who she was. According to the Ramban, there's no proof, because the Ramban reads it the other way around. Says Achsam Soifer, Halacha Lamaisa, you're not allowed to. It's a of lying. Very interesting. Okay, but be it as it may, that's the question. There's a stira in the Psukim. And we're going to give a new answer. Okay? Not like Rashi, not like the Ramban. Fine, so that was question number six. Number 15. Perak Chavdalet Pasuk Lamentes. Vo'oimar el Adoni. And Eliezer tells Lavan and Mesuel, Ulai, I said to my master, Ulai lo yisei lecho yishach aroi. Maybe the woman won't want to follow me. I said to my master, Maybe the woman won't want to follow me. So Rashi says, The word Ulai is spelled Aleph Lamed Yod. Eli ksev, to me. Bas hoisaloi Eliezer. Eliezer had a daughter. Vahaya mechazer limtsoi ila. And he was searching to find an excuse. Sheyoimer loi Avraham. That Avraham should say, you know what? Lifnoi say love la hasiyo bitai. Eliezer was trying to make Avraham feel that it's going to be so convenient to get a woman from this place that it's not kadai. And he wanted Avraham just to say, you know what? Just marry him off to your own daughter. Amr alai Avraham, Avraham said, B'ni Baruch, my son is blessed, V'yata Aror, you are cursed, V'ein Aror medabek b'baruch, and one who is cursed will not cling to one who is blessed. In other words, Avraham Avinu said, fat chance, there's no way I'm marrying my daughter off to, my son off to your daughter. Here's the problem. Did you notice where Rashi makes this comment? Did you notice that Rashi makes the comment of Ulai lo acharai in Eliezer's repeating of the story to love and Besuel? Why doesn't Rashi say in Pasuk in number three Ulai lo acharai? Why doesn't Rashi medayik over there? The Medrash is medayik it over there. Why doesn't Rashi bring it down on there? You'll say there it says it with a vav. So is it only because of the Vav? And even if it does say a Vav, why does the Torah only say Vav? Why does the Torah only say Vav the first time and not the second time? So this is a question of Rabbi Chaim Brisker, uh, the Grach. And the Grach gives a beautiful Teretz, a brilliant Teretz. The Grach says like this. This is, um, 
pure Reb Chaim. Only Reb Chaim would come. Reb Chaim says like this. When Eliezer is charged by Avram with the mission to go find a wife for Yitzchak, so Eliezer says to himself, you know, is this a good idea? Avraham, just imagine the scenario. I'm a big Eved. And I'm going to go to a father and say, would you mind if your little girl comes back with me, just me by myself, to a foreign country? Don't worry, I'll take care of her. I mean, what father in the right mind is going to give a girl to an Eved and entrust an Eved with the care of this girl? So it's a legitimate question that Eliezer has to Avraham. Maybe they're not going to let the girl come back with me. We don't detect any improper motives in the fact that Eliezer is expressing, expressing hesitation that maybe they're not going to let her come with me. But now we're talking about what Eliezer is telling Lavan and Besuel. Eliezer's job is to make the Shidduch happen. Would any Shadchan in the right mind say, you know, I was thinking about the Shidduch, and I told the other side that maybe you're not going to like the Shidduch, and you're not going to be interested, and why is he staring the Shidduch? Why in the world? What's wrong with the man? Why is he telling Lavan and Besuel that he told Avraham that they're not going to be interested? He's staring the Shidduch. He's ruining it. Uh, obviously he has an improper motive. The fact that he's revealing, disclosing this information, clearly, he, deep down, he's trying to stop it from, hey, even maybe he doesn't recognize what he's doing. But clearly there's an improper motive over there. That's how Reb Chaim learns it. But Marv Rabbi it's a good question though. The question is, Ein Beis HaMedosh Belichidosh, as we said, why in fact do Chazal only derive this improper motive the second time around and not the first time around. Okay. And finally, the eighth question is, look at number 18. Behold, I'm standing by the spring. And the alma that goes out to draw. Huh? This is what Eliezer is saying, that he told Avraham, I'm gonna, uh, he, that, excuse me, that Eliezer is saying over to Lavan and Mesuel, I'm standing by the spring, and the girl, the Alma, the Alma? She's not called the Alma ever here. Why is she even called the Alma? What kind of word is Alma? Every single time she's called what? The Nara. Every other time it's called Nara. Where does this Alma business come from? Question number eight. Okay, now before we start the answer, I just want to give you the winning lottery numbers for the next lotto. Okay, you ready? Okay, so everyone took out their pen. So, I'm just joking. But if we have eight questions, you for sure have to write down the eight questions. If you write down the winning lottery numbers, then certainly you have to write down the eight questions. Or you could just memorize it. I know everyone has a photographic memory. So forget the pen, you don't need the pen. Okay. You got it? You better remember these eight questions. Eight questions. Question number one. Was Eliezer a tzaddik? Was he Moshe B'chal Shaloi? Was he a Zikan Beisoy? Did he have Hajas Panim like Avram Avinu? Or was he Auror? Who is Eliezer? That's question number one. Question number two. Why in the beginning is Hashem Elikei HaShamayim Elikei HaOretz? And then Hashem is demoted to Elikei HaShamayim. Question number three. Avram says, I'm going to send a Malach. There ain't no Malach. Question number four. Is he an Ish? Is he a Malach? Is he a Malach? Is he an Ish? What is this guy? Eved, thank you. Is he an Ish or an Eved? An Eved or an Ish? What is he? Vayoratz. Is he a man of action or is he Mishtoya? Or is he waiting to see what's going to happen? Number six, why the first time around does the Torah give us the details of the weights, of the Ramazim, to the Shnei Luchais, to Aser Sadibrais, and the second time it omits it? What question was number that? Six. six. Question number seven. Question number seven. Why the first time around do Chazal not comment on any improper motive on the, on the uh, part of Eliezer and the second time they pick it up? 
Question number eight. What? Alma. Is she a Nara or is she an Alma? Is she a Nara or is she an Alma? Okay. So Rabbi Isai, what I would like to share with you today is the amazing perush of the Shla HaKadosh, Rabbi Shaya Horowitz, the Shla HaKadosh. Rabbi Isai, how many tzaddikim in history are called Kadosh? So it's said over there are three tzaddikim that are called Kadosh. Who are they? The Shla HaKadosh, the Rachayim HaKadosh, and the Ari HaKadosh. You could add another two for sure. The Alshech HaKadosh, Rashi HaKadosh, Okay. Um, be it as it may, the Shla always wanted to move to Eretz Yisrael. And uh, when his wife passed away, he made concrete plans. And the following year, he, uh, he left without even basically telling his family about it. Instead, he wrote um, what he called an ethical will to leave his family with something. And that ethical will is what we have like five tremendous volumes of the Shla Kadash who lived from 1558 to 1630. He moved to Eretz Yisrael, he came to Tzvas, and then ultimately Parshas Vayetze, he walked through the gates of Yushalayim. That's why the name of his uh, Siddur is Shara Shamayim, because uh, he came to Yushalayim the week of the Pasuk Vizeh Shar Hashamayim. Interestingly, one of the reasons why the Shla decided to print on the Siddur, he made a very simple calculation. He said, why am I writing a Sefer? For Habatzas Torah. What Sefer has the greatest circulation? Sidurim, right? People buy Sidurim. So he figured it. The, the Bach writes that anyone who prays from the Siddur of the Shlach HaKadosh, his Tfilah Sayyid La Yashav Reikam. Besides being a great Talmud Chacham, the Shla was a tremendous Marabetz Torah. He had hundreds of thousands of Talmidim. He was also a very wealthy man. And his house... He never ate on his house at his table without serving 80 of his Talmidim at the meal. So he was a very big Mepharnes Talmid Chachamim. I want to share with you an incredible story about the Shla. I I don't know why this story is not so well known. It's brought in the Ben Yehoyada, Masech the Bab Metziah, Dav Chavdal at Amad Beis. The Shla, when he was in Ashkenaz, something was stolen from his house, a silver goblet. And one of his Talmidim was suspected. One of the Talmidim Hashla was suspected. And the, the Shla investigated. And he darshaned and he searched. And in, uh, yes, they found it in fact that it was stolen by this particular Talmud. And the Talmud was so embarrassed. The Talmud left the yeshiva. He went off OTD. And he converted to Christianity. Okay, that's the story. Anyway, this uh, student, this former student became very successful. And he found favor of Be'enei HaMelech. And he was appointed to be the chief tax collector in the city of Yafo in Eretz Yisrael. The Shlad heard that his student had uh, converted, but he never knew what happened to him. Okay, be it as it may, many years later, the Shlad came to Eretz Yisrael to live in Yushalayim. And he visited the city of Yafo. And the former student recognized him. He was a tax collector. And he uh, gave the Shla great kavod, and he invited him to come to his palace. And the Shla comes to his palace. And the former student says, no, I want to show you something in my room. He comes in the room, he says, no, I want to show you something in my inner sanctum. Uh, he finally closes the door behind them. They're both alone in the room. And the, this tax collector, the for, former student, whips a big sword out of his, uh, out of his shirt. He says, bend down, bend over, I'm going to kill you. So I said, no, please don't. I, well, what did I do? Let's talk this out. I don't want to hear anything. Bend down, say Vidar, I'm going to kill you. And the Shlach tried to the police said, don't say another word. You say another word, you're dead on the spot. Say Shema, and I'm going to kill you. So the Shlach said Shema, Bechol Kavanosai. He said Echad, whereupon the student bent over and kissed the Shlach on his head. He says, Rebbe Umayri, please be Meichel me that I had to do this to you. So says, who are you? Who am I? I'm your former student. And I felt compelled to do this to you. Because I know you're an like him. I know you're a Moshe Nefesh to come to Eretz Yisrael. And I know in Shamayim, when you go up to Shamayim, you're going to be rewarded with tremendous schar. But I feel that you have a kesem katan on your neshama, a small stain on your neshama. That is, 
you contributed to me converting to Christianity. And therefore I made a cheshvan, not to punish you, but at least to expunge this stain that you have on your neshama, because we know that Misa is mechaper, but it's not the Misa itself, it's the, the fright of Misa that's mechaper. And now, now you've been neshaper for uh, your contribution to my going off of that. I mean, what I'm telling you now, not a story, it's in the Ben Yehoyada, Mesech Debel Metziah, Chavdalad, Amad Beis. Quite a frightening story. Okay, so be it as it may, the Shla Kadosh says really an uh, incredible pshat in this uh, parsha. It's really a pshat that works for other parshas as well, and we might even do it for an upcoming parsha. And the Shla says, let me introduce it in two ways. Number one, number one, we know that by the Akedah it says Avraham, Avraham. Now Baruch Hashem Avraham had good hearing, it was not necessary to say his name twice. Right? It wasn't like Achashverosh. Achashverosh. Who? Right? It wasn't like him. Wow, you have a good sense of humor. Okay. So, also Moshe. Moshe, Moshe. Why do we repeat his name twice? So, Rabbi Chaim Velazhner says, because the truth is that there are two components of the neshama. If I were to ask you right now, where is your neshama? I don't know, people point to different parts of their body, you know, where is the neshama? The answer is 99.9% of the neshama is upstairs in shamayim, tachas kisei hakamayit. The neshama trickles down, 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 down until the bottom part of the neshama is housed in the body. But the body to the neshama is like the shoe to the body. The same way nobody lives in their shoe, ex- except for the little old lady, so too, no, um, the body is not the home of the neshama, the body is the shoe of the neshama. So you have really two components of the neshama, the neshama upstairs and the neshama downstairs. The thing is that most of us, actually all of us, our body influences the neshama down here and it gives it a connection to the physical, that there now is a disconnect between the neshama upstairs and the neshama downstairs. Even Avraham Avinu was subject to this. That's why there's a psik in between the words Avraham and Avraham. Avraham upstairs was sort of separated from the Avraham downstairs. That's just the, the fate of mankind. The only person who his body did not physicalize his neshama, and there's no psik between the upstairs neshama and the downstairs, is Moshe. There's no psik in the, between the two words, Moshe and Moshe. This is what Reb Chaim Velazhna writes in the Ruach Chaim, in the first Mishnah on Perkei Abbas, Okay. So what we learn from here is, that while we all live downstairs, and our neshama that we're in touch with is downstairs, there is a component of us that is in the shamayim. Meaning, like the Gemara says in Megillah, sometimes a person is afraid. They don't know why they're afraid. Sometimes a person has anxiety. They don't know why they have anxiety. The Gemara says, you don't realize it, but the, your neshama up there realizes something's, uh, something's coming. Okay. Another, another uh, idea to help us assimilate what the, um, what the Shlach is going to teach us is the last Rashi in Parsha, Parsha Shlach. What does the ra- last Rashi in Parsha Shlach say? How many strings of tzitzis do we have? Eight. Why? Kenega the eight days from when we left Mitzrayim until we sang Shira. Remember that Rashi? The reason we have eight strings is Kenega the eight days from when we left Egypt until we sang Az Yashir. So, so maybe we could cut off one of our strings because actually there are only seven days. So Maral says, what are you talking about? We know that whenever something happens down here, <coughs> In order for it to occur up here, down here, it had to already transpire upstairs. We physically left Mitzrayim on the first day of Pesach, but when did the angel of Mitzrayim kill over and die? Erev Pesach, when they were makar of the carbon Pesach. Once the Sar Mishal Mitzrayim killed over, it's as if we're free already. So you're right, physically we left on the first day of Pesach. But the... the Ability to leave and the spiritual root of being able to leave already was effectuated era of Pesach. So in fact, from when we spiritually left until we sang Shira, it's eight days. One more example of what we're about to say. And that is, when Yaakov Avinu um, meets the Malach, 
In Parshas Vayishlach, Yaakov Avinu wrestles with the Malach. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So what does the Pasuk say? Um, uh, the Pasuk says, Vayoymer lo Yaakov yeyomer o yishim chagim yisro ki sarisa em alakim yamano shemat tuchal You wrestled with gods and with men and you won! Who are the men? Rashi says, Esav and Lavan. Lavan I get. Yaakov never f- faced Esav yet. So why is the Malach saying, you fought with men and you prevailed, namely Esav, Yaakov didn't face Esav? Yes, he did. Once he beat the ministering angel of Esav, Esav is as good as dead. Esav is a foregone conclusion. Esav is a natural consequence. From all the above ideas, we see that yes, it looks like something's taking place downstairs, but even though it's taking place da- uh, downstairs, there's a parallel event that's taking place upstairs first or simultaneously. Be it when we left Mitzrayim, be it when Yaakov encounters Esav, be it in general, we have a physical presence downstairs and a spiritual presence upstairs. Therefore, says Ashla Kadosh, even though Al Derach Hapshat, this week's parsha is repeated, but on a deeper level, there's no repetition. We have two episodes; they both transpired simultaneously, or one before the other. The first one is the way the Shidduch presented itself and transpired Bishamayim, and the second time is the way this whole Shidduch played out Baaretz. And there's no repetition, and I believe this explains all the nuances of difference. The Shla addresses many of them. And Besiata de Shmaya, I think we could use the Shla to explain some of the others. But the way the Shla says it is like this There's an angel on high. The angel on high is called the Shoimer Yisrael. Who is the Shoimer Yisrael? Not the Chas Vashon, the Democrat senator who likes to say he is, ridiculous, but rather the Shoimer Yisrael is the Malach Matatrin. Vahu Hashliach Shomala. Who's that? That the Malach Matatroin is called the Shoimer Yisrael. The word Matat indicates a master, like the Chachomim call the Geveras Matroina. They call a Shliach Mantatar. Okay, so the Malach Matatroin is the Shliach and the Malach of Klal Yisrael. He is also called. In Eved, in a way, because he services the Jewish people. He is Ma'ada Zakan Beisai. He's the elder statesman of God's hosts. And he's Moshe Bechal Shalai. He rules over the heaven. God gives him control over the heaven. Okay. Take a look at the Shlach Kadesh in Oishchaf in number 21. When Avraham sent Lamata Avdoi Zakan Beisai Moshe Bechal Shalai. He sent with him Eved Zakan Bayis Hamosh Bukhash Alamala. Meaning like this Avraham told Eliezer, Hey, look, Eliezer, you're my faithful servant. We live in a physical world. You down here are being sent to find the Shidduch for Eliezer, and you're going to be the physical messenger to do so. But I need to. I need to send someone up in heaven to advocate on your behalf to allow this to play out heavenly so that it could come to fruition down here on earth. And that individual who's going to take care of it in heaven is Malach Matat, who Yishlach Malach Ha'ilafanecha. So you'll ask, where does the Malach appear? The Malach is the first time the story is appear, uh, um, appears in the Torah. We're going to, we're going to explain it uh, more explicitly. Okay. Now, when... Avraham makes the Eved downstairs swear. Avada and Pasagimel, he says, V'yashbi'acha b'ashem elokei ha'shamayim elokei ha'ores. When the physical Eliezer swears, he's swearing by the God of heaven and the God of earth. Because Eliezer lives down here on earth. But when Avraham makes the Malach of heaven swear, he doesn't need to mention the God of earth, because he's dealing with Matat b'shamayim. So that answers that question. Okay, but as Eliezer is going, Chayfeif alav kavod ha'eved shalmala the malach matat. Says the Shla, tremendous rev- um, revelation. Whenever it says the word eved, that's Eliezer. Whenever it says ish, 
That's the Malach. We know Malachim are called Ish, like Gavriel. The ha Ish Gavriel in Sefer Daniel. Or by Yosef, Ayim Tzayehu Ish. Ish refers to Malachim, Ishim. So Eved is the Malach. Excuse me, Eved is Eliezer. Ish is the Malach. Malach is called Ish. Ah, now we understand. Is this individual acting or is it waiting? So take a look at number eight. Vayaratz ha'eved Eliezer physically runs, but the Malach b'shamayim. Look at number nine. Vehaish mishtoela. The Malach was pensive, waiting. Says the Shlach for the Shefa min hashamayim for this situation to play out. So there's no contradiction. The Eved was Yaratz. The Ish was mishtoya. What does it mean, La Das? Hahetzliach Hashem Darkoyim Loi? This is sort of a side point. What do you mean, Hahetzliach Oi Loi? Adar Ya Adar Nisht? Yeah, because he sees who's coming out of the Shidduch, who's going to be born from Rivka and Yitzchak, Yaakov, and Esav. So the Hahetzliach is Yaakov. Oi Loi, that's going on Esav. Fine. This Malach, when, when this is transpiring in Shamayim, there are all kinds of secrets and soydos and ramazim taking place. So heavenly, he's giving a ring that's what? Tud semidim, that weighs asara zav, and his beka mishkaloi. He has all kinds of what we call lofty gahoibene kavanas of what the secret meaning of the jewelry represents. That's the first time the story appears, because that's the malach ch- making it happen in the shamayim. So we need to know all the kabbalistic secrets. But down here, Ba'aretz, nobody cares about the weight of the jewelry. I don't think anybody ever proposed, handed a woman a ring, and she said, wait one second. And she whips out a weight, and she weighs it. Ah, oh, this weighs 613. This is connected the Mitzvah Satoira. Anyone who does that, see me privately. Okay? That's not, that's not what happens downstairs. This, this, down here in this world, no one could care less about the weight and the ramazim of the jewelry that you give. That's the first time the story appears, says the Shla. The first time the story appears is the Malach Matad conducting the mystical pre-enactment in heaven. The second time, the way it actually physically plays out, we don't need, it's irrelevant to say the mystical details, says the Shla. Furthermore, the first time the story appears, the Malach knows this is going to work. This is going to be successful. He knows who she is. So heavenly, he places the ring on her. And afterwards, just ask, by the way, who are you? But he knows who she is. Down here, Ba'aretz, there's no way Eliezer is giving her jewelry without knowing who she is. So down here, Ba'aretz, Abad, he says, who are you? And then he gives her the jewelry. Vashem enai. That this explains very clearly why Chazal only pick up on an improper uh, motive the second time the story appears, and not the first time. The first time, we're not dealing with Eliezer, we're dealing with the Malach and Shemayim. He has no improper motives, he has no daughters, he doesn't want to be Meshadach of his angeless, angelette to Yitzchak. He's trying to do his mission that Avram summoned him to. So, Ulai loy soiva ha'isha. But Chazal don't detect any improper motive. It's the second time when it's the physical Eliezer. So Chazal say, when he says, Ulai lo he, he had an improper motive. But Chazal would never have picked it up the first time because it wasn't present. It wasn't Eliezer. It was the Malach. Okay. Let's see if we could um, wrap this up. Look in Ois Chav Beis. <coughs> And That's Ruchani. That's Ramaz Tadvarim Ruchaniyam. The Chazaras Hadvarim. That's Sipur Hadvarim. By the way, that's why. Let's take a look. We asked, one of the questions is, in the very same Pasuk, he turns from an Ish into an Eved. So it's Pashat. Up to what point was this Malach needed to make this Shidduch successful? Up to the point where they give her, give Eliezer the girl. Once they give Eliezer the girl, the, you know, finito, he's done. On to the next. So look at number 10. Now, you know, this is his final... 
the summation, the closing, his closing act. Once he has the girl, now he's gone, and uh, Eliezer takes her home. Okay, so this explains, says the Shlom, let's just read this in Oishchav. Gimel, v'hinei Rivka ha-maskelas Rivka, the wise prophetess, understood. Now, she's very smart, Rivka. This is how the Shlom learns. She actually knew that with Eliezer is the Malach Matat. So he says like this. Why when the Eved repeats the message, Kara Isa Alma. Why is she called Alma? When the Eved repeats the story. There's like the sixth line in Oish Chav Gimel. Da. Ki timtza Torah tamed nara. The Torah always says nara. Nara ksev. The nara kri. You know why? The Gemara Nivama says, who says the following pasuk? Nar ha yisi gamza kanti v'loi ra yisi tzadik ne'ezav. The Gemara Nivama is daf tesvav. Tezayin. Who says that? Nar ha yisi gamza kanti v'loi ra yisi ne'ezav. Says the Gemara, Malach shall oila matachroin. Says the pasuk Nara Yisi. Therefore, whenever we refer to her in this episode, she's called Nara Nara, because she understood that the Nar referring to the Malach Matachroin is here. Verivka Hanaviyah Hamaskelas Sheyada Hadvarim Bruchanias. Rivka understood the spiritual component. Mistama Gilsa Isam Lalavan. He she probably. Revealed it to Lavan. So in other words, not only did Rivka say this is not just a physical act that's taking place, but there's a spiritual counterpart. She told Lavan about it, and even though Lavan is no tzaddik, but he understood these types of things, says Ashla. Therefore, when Rivka and Lavan talk, he's always called Ish. Why? Because they chapped on to the deeper meaning here. Rivka and Lavan understood that even though there's an Eved in their home, but really there he's being represented by a spiritual counterpart in Shamayim. Therefore, in their conversations, he's always referred to as Ish. And therefore, the Torah refers to him as what they thought he was. Therefore, Rivka is called Nara, Teshava Nara, Nikra La Nara, V'loi B'Shem Alma, to indicate that Rivka understood this was coming from the Malach Matat. But as soon as the Eved takes her back, he's no longer called Ish, V'atakam Rivka, V'atelachna Achari Ha'ish, and once they hit the road, V'yikach Ha'eved as Rivka, and it could be the word Vayelach is going on. The Ish was Vayelach. The Ish left. The Malach left. And it sounds like from the Shla that he's answering our first question as well, because he concludes that Kenan biyadai moizne mir malashik ohev ha inyan ha malash shal zivu kunim bala mikach kavod ha eved o elyan asher ha yechayfei falav. When Chazal say that Eliezer looked like Avram. And he ruled over his yetz like Avram. That's at that moment when he was being hovered upon by this Malach Matad. He, so he's invested with some of that supernatural power, but that wasn't his intrinsic personality. His intrinsic personality was Aurur Kanan. Okay, so Rabbi, say back to our eight or nine questions here very quickly. So is Eliezer um, an Aurur or is he Moshe B'chal HaShaloi? The answer is the Moshe B'chal HaShaloi was whatever abilities he was infused with through the Malach Matat, but he intrinsically was what we call Aurur. When, question number two, when Avraham made Eliezer down here swear, as well as Aretz, the mat- Matat swear, that's only Elikei HaShamayim. Where's the Malach? The Malach is the Ish. That's the Malach. Is he an Ish or an Eved? It depends. The Eved is Eliezer. The Ish is a Malach Matad. Is he Vayaratz or is he Mishtoya? The Eved is Vayaratz. The Malach is Mishtoya. Why are the Ramazim the, um, the first time around, not the second time? The first time around is the spiritual account. The second time around is the physical account. Why the first time does he first give the jewelry? The second time he first asks? Again, the first time was a spiritual account. In, in the Malach's mind, he didn't have to ask. Why do Chazal only detect the improper motive the, the second time around? The second time around was the physical, um, actual way the story unfolded. And therefore, she's only called Ha'alma when, uh, the, when Eliezer is repeating the story. Because in his mind, this is a physical account. But says the Shla, Rivka and Lavan actually understood the symbolic... Uh, 
taking place, and, that, and that's why ultimately Lavan and Mesor are the ones who say, May Hashem Yat Sahadabar. Whether they were uh, tzaddikim or not, they did recognize that there was a spiritual component to, to this particular shidduch. And actually, this is a, really just a taste of how the Shla learns a number of incidents in the Chumash, how there's like a dual, uh, a dual um, event taking place, that while things unfold down here, simultaneously things are happening in the Shamayim. Rabbi, say thank you for coming. Goodbye. Have a wonderful day. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.